We are going to finish off our discussion of circular motion by looking at three common circular motion examples that involve not only centripetal force and gravity, but also friction, normal reaction force, tension force, really all the forces that we've seen thus far uh, in this topic. Uh, and we are going to look at each of these three different examples in separate videos. This first one uh, is called the rotor. Uh, so to get a sense of what the rotor is, we will see in a little bit. But first, let's just remind ourselves of the equations that we know uh, and have been using in the last couple of videos um, so far. So these equations for linear velocity, for the centripetal acceleration, the centripetal force, using some different variables like linear velocity, radius, uh, angular velocity, period. Uh, we are going to be reaching into these, especially this centripetal force uh, in these three different examples. All right, so the rotor uh, is a classic fair ride. It's possible that you have experienced a ride similar to this called like the Gravitron or, or something where you get into this spinning cylinder uh, and you get stuck to the wall. Some of them nowadays have angled walls that not only do you get stuck to the wall, but because of this and uh, the circular motion actually pushes you up the wall a little bit. Uh, here, in this case, uh, the floor actually dropped out uh, once they were stuck to the wall. So I'm going to show you a couple different examples of this in action. All right, so here's our first example. Uh, this ride is spinning. You can't tell because the camera person is in the ride. Uh, so relative to them, and look, the floor <laughs> dropped out and they are stuck to the wall because it is spinning so fast. We'll talk about the forces that are at play and what causes them to get stuck. Uh, here is another example. So this example is nice because you can actually see the rotor spinning because the camera is fixed uh, from a different perspective. So here it is spinning up a little bit faster, uh, going faster still, and eventually it gets to the point that uh, it's moving fast enough that they get stuck to the wall. And once they're going fast enough, you can actually see that some of the kids are making themselves go horizontally um, because they are so, so stuck. And the final example here is one that I made uh, just out of a turntable, Lazy Susan, uh, and a poster and my daughter's cricket toy uh, getting stuck to the wall using nothing but the forces at play in this circular motion. All right, so let's talk about what these forces are that cause them to get stuck to the wall. Um, now, they have mass. Each of these riders have mass. So we can indicate that just by drawing, um, drawing in some forces. Right now, there is clearly a force that's pushing them towards the center. That force is perpendicular to the surface. As the surface is vertical, um, that force, normal reaction force, is pointing perpendicular to the surface, which is towards the center. There is a force of gravity because they have mass pulling them down towards the center of the Earth which means that there has to be one more force that is pushing up to cancel out uh, that force of gravity because they're not moving up or down and certainly not accelerating up or down. And the force that's causing them to not move down is the force of friction. Uh, so just like we can calculate the force of gravity, mass times gravity, we can calculate the force of friction, coefficient of friction times uh, that normal reaction force. So let's look at this in a slightly different um, arrangement. Uh, imagine here that the wall of the rotor is clear, it's transparent that we can see through it. Um, and here is our, our person. Now, this idea of why don't they fall down is looking at those forces. R, we said, was the force pushing in towards the center just because that's perpendicular uh, to the wall. It's the wall that's pushing on them to cause them to move in a circle. Force of gravity is down and the force of friction is up. That force of friction is super important here because that prevents them from falling down. If you were to lubricate that, it wouldn't matter how fast it was going. If the coefficient of friction is low enough, they would never get stuck to the side of the wall. So friction is really important. But remember, friction plays into R. So if we can do some stuff with R, make that bigger, you can increase the for force of friction that way as well. So this idea of knowing that the normal force and friction are interrelated is going to help us solve this problem. Um, just looking at our forces here, we've got R going um, sideways, FG going down, and FF pointing up. Normal reaction force, R, 
and the coefficient of friction mu um, are both going to be used to help us find the force of friction. And we know that the centripetal force, Fc, is equal to mass times the velocity squared divided by r, or mass times omega squared angular velocity times r. Um, and we also know from our, our last videos that the net force and the centripetal force are basically the same thing. Um, so some other factors that we can just figure out from this picture is we know that force of friction going up uh, is equal and opposite to the force of gravity going down. And that means that force of friction and force of gravity would cancel out no matter what they are, which means there's only one remaining force. That's the, the force of R, um, that normal reaction force. So what we can do there is we can say, all right, the only force that's remaining is going to give us our net force. And that net force, when it's moving in a circle, is equal to the centripetal force. So we know all of that has to be R. So the net force is the centripetal force. There's two ways of saying the same thing for circular motion. And that must equal the normal reaction force for this example of a rotor. So we can find Fc and F net by using this equation if we know some information about the motion. If we know that, we know R. If we know R, we know that there. We know Fg, we know Ff. And then all that's remaining is the coefficient of friction. So let's look at that as an example here. The rotor ride is one that presses you against the walls, a spinning car as the floor drops away. The coefficient of static friction between the wall and a 75 kilogram rider is mu is equal to 0.06. That's actually pretty slippery. Uh, I think it'll still work. If the ride is rotating an angular velocity of 5.2 radians per second, what must be the radius of this rotor? All right, so this uh, example, we are actually given mu, and we're trying to figure out the size of the rotor itself. So let's plug in what we know, uh, or figure out some, some equalities that are based on this picture. We drew this picture just like we did before, Fg going down, Ff going up, and R pointing towards the center. Ff and Fg are equal and opposite. Friction and weight are equal and opposite. So we know that mu times R, force of friction, is equal to mass times gravity, um, force of gravity. So plugging in the numbers that we know, we know mu, we know mass, we know gravity. So we can find R. R is just 12,263 newtons. So why is that going to be useful to us? Well, you might remember that the normal reaction force is equal to the centripetal force because FF and FG cancel each other out. So the only force that's remaining overall to cause it to move in a circle is um, R. And we know that the centripetal force can be calculated in a variety of different ways. We want to find the radius of the rotor. Both of these equations have the radius of the rotor in them. They have R. So in order to figure out which one we're going to use, we have to look at what we have. We know that the angular velocity is 5.2 radians per second. That is omega. So because of that, we are going to use the part of this equation that uses omega. Fc is equal to mass times the angular velocity squared times the radius. And we know that Fc is equal to r. So plugging in the values, uh, really the only one that we don't know is r. So solving that through we can find that the radius of this thing is about 6.5 meters. Uh, it has a pretty big rotor, to be totally honest. Uh, and the reason it had to be that big for this particular angular velocity is because it was a very low coefficient of friction. So plugging that through, just a reminder, we use the equality that Fg was equal and opposite to Ff for this example. Um, and the idea that R is equal to the, co or the centripetal force and from those relationships, we are able to work out what the radius of the rotor had to be. Now, in this case, we didn't actually need the mass. So I'm going to solve this through without using the mass to show you that mass actually cancels. So the way that we started is the same, that we know that FF is equal to FG. That means because of these relationships that mu times R is equal to mass times gravity. Okay. We know also that the centripetal force is equal to mass times omega squared r, and that the centripetal force in this scenario is equal to capital R, the normal reaction force. So if I plug in this equation instead of r, because they're equal, 
I get mu is equal to mass times omega squared times r equals mg. Notice that mass is on both sides, so that cancels out. And I'm left with mu omega squared r is equal to gravity. I know that gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. I know that the omega is 5.2. And I know that uh, mu is 0 0.06. It turns out I didn't need to know that the, the rider was 75 kilograms. Uh, regardless of the rider's mass, I would still end up with the same answer, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. Um, that you wouldn't need a different side, size ride for the, the people of different mass. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to enjoy the same ride together. All right, so as a recap of all of that, we know that for a rotor, force of gravity is going down and force of friction is preventing you from sliding down. That is the force pushing up. So in order for you to not be accelerating up or down, FF has to equal FG. That is like a hidden equation that is built into this example. And you know that if you draw the, the free body diagram, we also know that pointing towards the center is R and because FF and FG are equal and opposite, the overall force is R, the net force. And that means that the centripetal force, because it's moving in a circle is also R. So our takeaway here, you should know how to draw a free body diagram and solve when circular motion is produced by a normal reaction force like it is here in the rotor problem.